Hey, welcome to the live stream Sunday night. Woo -hoo. Hey, we're continuing our Joshua series. Pastor Jeff, how many did we baptize this afternoon out the river? Uh, Pastor Brian, about between 25 and 30. It was awesome. It was yeah. incredibly awesome. Yeah. And let me tell you, let me tell you a secret. When we were doing it, Brian was down over here on this side, right? I mean, he's right here. Here's Luke baptizing every other one. Luke, Jeff, Luke, Jeff, Luke, Jeff. And Brian's right here. And they finished. They come over and take a picture. About three quarters of the way through, here comes a snake. It's a big snake this big. Right at Brian. And Brian runs like a chicken. I, I'm telling you the truth. I've never seen anybody run in mud and water so fast. All my life. I'm telling you right now. Yeah. Now, this is a pointless sermon. I've got to, this tonight. Now, there's, at the three, there's three takeaways at the end that are simple. And when I get there, in case I forget, because I'm very forgetful. I mean, you can't even believe how forgetful I am. I can't even remember my wife's name. I think it's like Penelope, I'm thinking, something like that. And uh, so, yeah, uh, you, let me just tell you what, um, what was I saying? Oh, three takeaways, and they'll be on the screen, so get your cameras ready and take pictures of those screens. There'll be three takeaways that you won't remember unless you take a photo, because you won't be able to write them down fast, okay? Now, I don't need myself in the, in the monitor. I don't need myself. This feels, feels like I'm hearing ringing. I don't know, that's probably Pastor Jeff doing something over there, I'm not sure. Um, really, I'm, I'm really not sure. But anyway, take your Bibles and turn to Joshua chapter five. And I t titled this, Tear Down Those Walls. And I just had the, I've always wanted the title, I don't know if it's a good title, I just like that title. And, and the reason is, is because Ronald Reagan was like my president, you know. He's still my president. And uh, no, I'm just kidding about that, he's he dead. But anyway, remember he told, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down those walls. I mean, remember that? Everybody, you are old like me, if you remember that. You young people, you don't remember that, right? So I love that, that's just why I did it. It's about the walls of Jericho, starting in chapter five, verse 13. And we're gonna read through verse 15. And I think we have, is it NASB, Pastor Zach? Pastor Zach, we're short of office staff and he put this in for me right before church. We're look, we're gonna, we've got somebody we're about to hire to, that, that's just perfect, I think. I don't know for sure, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> And Tammy's gone two weeks, and when she goes away, old man Weaver falls apart. Now, these other pastors can do their own administrative work, and they create graphics, they create PowerPoints, they create all kinds of stuff. And I'll do good to email, you know. But anyway, that's the way that is. So we're going to start at chapter 5, verse 13. So here we go. Now, it came about when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing opposite him, with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, are you for us or for our adversaries? He said, no, rather I indeed come now as the captain of the host of the Lord. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and bowed down and said to him, what is my Lord to say to his servant? Would you pray with me, Father? I pray you'd help us to gain the application that is something we all need to remember and we forget so easily from this story. And let us, God, not only enjoy the story once again from our childhood, if those that know it, about the walls come a tumbling down, but let the Holy Spirit speak to us, God, in a special way and help me be able to deliver this in Jesus' name. Amen. I have had a long, long week and my head hurts right back here all the way up and around my ears and uh, I had a thing cut off my ear and I quit dyeing my hair now I look like a white ghost and I've gotten heavy uh, in COVID weight you know and so uh, you're going to get what you get with me and I'm 67 years old so just buckle your seat belts okay the Israelites even though they had defeated the Ammonite kings on the east side of the Jordan and I've been there right on the east side of the Jordan, right next to Jericho. It's about a three minute drive to Jericho of the ruins, maybe five. Some of you help me remember, but not very far at all. They were on the east side of the Jordan quite a while and Jericho was the first city 
when they were to go across the Jordan in the promised land that they had to conquer to be able to conquer the Canaan land. And it was a fortified, walled city and is double walled, double walled. And Rahab lived, lived between the walls, which much of the time they did. And if an enemy would siege those double walls, they would quickly throw everything they had between the walls to give strength so that the walls didn't, you know, weren't just air behind them, but actually they worked together like a real thick wall. So they would pour stuff in there, but the poorer people would live between the walls. And when we were there, those of us at Israel, the last trip, we went to Jericho for the first time, and it was fascinating. Harry, maybe she'll remember it. Am I right, Roxana, that the one section where Rahab lived, because God promised not to destroy her, was the only section in all of Jericho where the walls were still standing. It was a small segment. We saw it with our own eyes. If you don't believe the Bible, go to Israel. Anyway, it was a fortified walled city, but it was really a fort. It wasn't like a city with a bunch of people. So when they went and took it and God was destroying it, he was destroying their army. So this was a, a guard post. This was a, a, a fort. And so, uh, and they had their defenses against the Israelites who had encamped a few miles east of the Jordan for many months. And it would require a miracle for the Israelites to take down this fortified walled city. And so the commander's words are nearly identical when he says, uh, in, in this passage when he says, and Joshua fell on his face to the earth and bowed down and said to him, when he bowed down, when he fell on his face, and you, you look at some of the other words, it's, it's the same thing that Moses had said to Yahweh back in Genesis chapter three, uh, uh, I mean, Exodus chapter three, verse five, when uh, God said to Moses, don't come any closer. God said, take off your sandals for the place you're standing is holy ground. And I think in the NIV and the King James, it's almost word for word in, in those two different passages there. And uh, so the commander here is none other than God himself, the warrior, the Lord of hosts. And uh, so why does he answer neither? He says, whose side are you on? God says neither. In many versions, he's basically saying, it's not that I'm on sides here. It's neither. It isn't, is it? But they think, well, isn't he for the cause of Israel, for Israel's army? Wouldn't God be on their side? No. Israel's army, listen to this, must be enlisted in his cause. He's the commander, not the army, not the, the army commanders. God is the commander. And when things are difficult, we wonder this question, is God on my side? Wrong question. Is God on my side is the wrong question. The question is, am I on God's side? And that's what God was saying here. Are you on God's side? That's the appropriate question. And like his forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God had now appeared to Joshua, and he lies prostrate on the ground before his Lord. Yahweh, the great warrior, the Lord of hosts, when you see that over and over, it's so many times in the Old Testament, especially the King James, you'll see it. They changed it to Almighty God many times in other versions, but it's the Lord of hosts, the Lord of hosts. He's saying, the captain of the army of God, the angels, big and mighty, the army of God that fights for his people. And so here's, here's uh, Joshua, like Moses, who falls down on his face and says, and says, you know, when God, and he says, take off your sandal, the place you're standing is holy ground, and he falls prostrate before God. So like, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, now God has appeared to Joshua, and he is lying prostrate on the ground before his Lord. So, here's a point that I want you to get a hold of, that God Almighty is the Lord of hosts, and he will judge righteously, and he will punish sin. God punishes sin. What that was about with uh, Jericho was these people were influencing sinfully the, pe the people of God coming against Israel, and he says enough, he punishes sin. God hates sin. So just what is the significance here? He identifies, God identifies himself as a commander, commander of, the, of the, the host of the Lord, supreme commander. And you can see it, as I mentioned, so many places. Let me just give you a couple of them. Genesis 32, one and two, Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's host. And he called the name of that place Mahan, oh man, help me, Pastor Dawkins, Mahan Mahanaim. 
And uh, so and then the next one I want you to give is 1 Kings twenty two nineteen. 19. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the hosts of heaven. There it is, the host of heaven. That's the army of God standing around him on his right and on his left. 1 Kings twenty two nineteen. And in Luke 2, 13, suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest. Christmas story. There's the army of God in the sky. And then Psalm 24, 7 to 10, lift up your heads, O gates. O be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. He's the captain of the army of God. He's the, the leader. And then uh, in uh, Isaiah 13, 4, the sound of a tumult is on the mountains as of a great multitude, the sound of an uproar of kingdoms, of nations gathering together. And the Lord of hosts, the Lord of hosts is mustering a host for battle. The Lord of hosts is calling the angels, the warriors of God for battle, Isaiah 13, 4. 1 Samuel 17, 45, David said to the Philistine, you come to me with sword and spear, remember this, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the Lord of hosts, and the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. The phrase Lord of hosts appears 285 times in the Old Testament in the King James Version, and again, like I said, in the NIV is translated the Lord Almighty many times, which really leaves out the military sense that God intended when he, when he was writing, giving us this. The whole Lord of hosts is not just an expression of greatness, but it's an armed, of armed might, armed might, willing to punish evil and uphold uh, righteousness. God punishes evil and upholds righteousness. We live in an area, an era rather, a time that has few military heroes anymore. We idolize men of the screen and the people that play sports and, and musicians and singers and groups and whatever else. But military heroes, military heroes, hardly. We distrust the military many times and deride it, except in times of war, then we encourage the bravery and the willingness to fight and stand up against wrong and against freedom and against oppression, against tyranny, against communism, against hate, against control. God wants freedom for man. He does not want us to be underneath the thumb of any man. Freedom is what God gave Jesus for. I have come to set you free. The Spirit of God sets us free. We're free people. Men and women are equal. All slave, slave and the free are free in God's eyes, and it's never God's intent for anyone to be uh, in slavery. So we admire those who succeed on the bloody battlefield and defeat the enemies of righteousness, who are our enemies. And I'm gonna tell you, we, could, you know, we see what's going on. The message of this passage in Joshua and the entire Bible for that matter is this. God is a mighty warrior, listen to this, who will judge righteously and punish sin, punish wrong. And that's what's happened in Jericho. He comes against them. If we believe that the God of love can never punish the wicked, then our Bible reading is narrow, too narrow indeed. He's a mighty God, and his mere presence is enough to win the battle, for the battle is the Lord's. And, and, and we, we see that. Even in the, the Revelation, listen to this. You hear this Old Testament terminology in Revelations. Revelation 19, 11 to 16, a white horse whose rider is called faithful and true. That's Jesus. With justice, he judges and makes war. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood. His name is the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. His name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him. There it is. They were following him, riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen. He treads the winepress of the fury of wrath of Almighty God on his robe and on his thigh. He, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And, and so clearly Jesus is the victor and perhaps this one that appeared to Joshua was none other than uh, pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, uh, definitely de deity. When Joshua gets up from the ground, the commander's gone, but Joshua can now go into the battle assured. Why? Because he knows that God will be with him who said in Joshua 1.9, we learned last week, be strong, God told Joshua, be courageous, 
do not be afraid. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For your Lord, your God will be with you wherever you go. And God has made that same promise to us, hasn't he? I will never leave you nor forsake you, he said. But sometimes we doubt. We say, well, where are you, God? Maybe some people are doing that now. Where are you when I need you? Have you left me? Will he save me from this trial I'm going through or the trouble of the world? Let me remind you, in every generation, people are martyrs. And now more than ever, millions have been martyred. Eleven disciples killed brutally way before their natural life. And then they thought they took care of old John, uh, uh, you know, the beloved. But, you know, he got tarred and feathered, but he didn't die, you know. And then he writes the revelation of Jesus. But anyway, so, hey, trouble may come to us, but guess what? Who's on our side? Don't be afraid. God is with us. Stay right with God. Walk with God. Be on his side, and God will protect us. God will be with us. It's our choice to be on God's side, and he will walk along with us and be our God, and his mighty warriors will help us. You remember the commander and his armies are with us, whether we see them or not. You know, remember Jesus is captured, and a small contingent of troops are in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember this? And Peter draws his sword to defend Jesus, his master, and whacks it off. Put that thing away. Heals the, the soldier. Put, he, and all that. And listen to what Jesus said, Matthew 26, 53. Do you think I cannot call on my father? Look what he says. And he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. Huh. You could have called 10,000 angels, man. The warrior says, as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have come, and this fulfills God's promise to Joshua. And Joshua knows that God will be with him, and he doesn't need to be discouraged. He'll be with him wherever he goes. So the commander is, the, is at the battle of Jericho with Joshua, and though unseen, you don't see him, the walls crumble at his mighty army, leaving only a little, the invisible army of God, only a little for Joshua's physical army to wipe up and finish up. It's the commander of God that's with us today too, this same God that brought the walls of tumbling down is with us. So what happened, if we go on and we pick up in chapter six, verse one, we're gonna see that uh, what we have to do is hear God and obey God. Chapter six, verse one. Well, he goes on, he says, I, I, I wanna get the other verse and it's okay, Pastor Zach, if you, we don't have this up there. It says, the captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, and this is what's exactly in, uh, in uh, Exodus, uh, that I read, remove your sandals from your feet for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Chapter six, one, Jericho was tightly shut because of the sons of Israel. In other words, Israel was out there close by and they didn't let anybody in to bring supplies. They didn't let anybody out. They were stuck inside those walls because his mighty army was out there. And you remember Rahab said, our people are afraid of Israel because of what God did opening the Red Sea. Did you hear that from Pastor Luke this morning? So realize they're afraid and watch this. It says, no one went out, no one came in. The Lord said to Joshua, see, I have given you Jericho into your hand with its king and the valiant warriors. You see, march around the city, all the men of war circling the city once. You shall do so for six days. And also seven priests shall carry seven trumps of rams, horns before the ark, ark of the covenant, the presence of God, right? Then on the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times. And the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall be that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people will go up every man straight ahead. You know, there's something about a shout that releases something. You remember with a loud voice Jesus commanded? Sometimes just shout, you know, and there's just something that releases. And I don't know what's going on there. I don't know that anybody does, but it's interesting that he told them to shout, and they did so. Going on, to verse six, so Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said to them, take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests carry seven trumps, trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. Then he said to the people, go forward and march around the city and let the armed men go on before the Ark of the Lord. And it was so that when Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord went forward and blew the trumpets and the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priest who blew the trumpets. And the rear guard, more armed men, came after the ark while they continued to blow the trumpets. But Joshua commanded the people saying, you shall not shout nor let your voice be heard nor 
let a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I tell you shout. Then you shall shout. So he had the ark of the Lord taken around the city, circling it once. And then they came into the camp and spent the, spent the night in the camp. Verse 12, Joshua rose early in the morning and the priest took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew the trumpets. And the armed men went before them and the rear guard came after the ark of the Lord while they continued to blow the trumpets. Thus the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did so for six days. Then on the seventh day they rose early at the dawning of the day and marched around the city in that same manner seven times on that seventh day. Only on that day they marched around the city seven times. So I'll just stop, I'll just stop right there. This, this, the, the Israelite armies are surrounding Jericho. They're cutting off the supplies from reaching them. The commander of the Lord gives Joshua specific instructions. And the defending soldiers high atop the walls of Jericho observing a strange procession that the first morning of siege, no armies rush the ramparts. In the distance, they can hear the sound of a shofar, the ram's horn trumpet of battle. And then they come marching in order. First the armed guard in ranks, then the priest blowing the shofar, then four priests carrying on the gilded poles over their shoulders a box draped in blue, according to Numbers chapter 4. After that, the priests march in a rear guard. Following the rear guard, the entire Israelite army marches in stillness. The dust billows from under thousands of feet, yet their voices are still. The procession seems endless. They circle the city once, then they return to the camp. The sound of chauffeurs dying in the distance and the muffled sound of marching armies finally are stopped. The next morning, the same thing happens again. And so uh, you're, you're sitting there going, what are they thinking? How far, how far was it around Jericho? Well, I was there, it's not real far. I looked that up, it's about a third of a mile. They marched around. March, march, march. Whatever the reason for these particular instructions to the Israelites, we don't know. But all we know is that they obeyed God and they followed them. And they obey God and they follow them. It's important to hear God and obey God. Even if we don't understand the orders. I'm sure the effect on those that were besieged in that city, that, that was, they were going around, they were in there, they were terrified. There were 600,000 troops that walked, watched around the walls of Jericho each day. And each day, the impending doom must have put a lot of fear in those people living in Jericho, those soldiers. Well, when will they attack? They don't attack. God takes care of it. All they did was obey. They heard God and they obeyed. Let me tell you something. In everything, if you can hear God and do what he says, even if it doesn't make sense. Sometimes it's given in a, a large amount of offering or given to someone. Sometimes it's stopping at a door and knocking on a door and say, do y'all need some milk? I've heard stories like that. There's some really weird things. Sometimes it's the dopiest guy in Iowa, God's saying, go start a church. And he does it. And he can't preach his way out of a wet paper bag only because Alan Yulstead talked him into it. Yeah. And sometimes in the middle of COVID, God speaks to a guy and says, don't retreat, don't hold still and wait for everything to blow over, keep moving forward and we're gonna move forward in faith because I'm seeing a vision of thousands of people coming to Christ through this church. I'm telling you, I believe it with everything within me. We've been seeing people respond every Sunday and every Sunday we're having new, more and more visitors. Every Sunday we are. So we're not gonna stop, we're gonna move forward even though in the, in the natural realm you might say, oh, let's be careful here, let's don't move forward. What are we gonna do? No, we're moving forward. And when that happens, when we hear God, when we hear God, then we see a great result. And when we see a great result, God gets the glory and we stand in amaze because we didn't do it, nor can we take credit. God's got to do it. Things that are bigger than us, things that are bigger than us. So, uh, the, sin is no joke, folks. And God judged Jericho because they're sin. You know, God, the Bible says, hates sin. And God tells Joshua to tell the armies, do not take any spoil, do not take any of the gold, don't take any plunder for yourself in that city, destroy everything, 
except spare Rahab to keep my promise to her because of how she took, this, took care of the spies. And they do that. They do that. They followed it and they obeyed. And God blessed. Now, I want to tell you something. <clears throat> you might be struggling with the, the inhabitants of Jericho and other Canaanite cities that God is destroying them. We become so upset that we begin to judge God himself for doing this. But be careful not to do that because destruction, again, has to do with sin. And consider the verses from the Pentateuch. It says in Genesis 15, 16, in the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. In Leviticus 18, 24 and 25, it says, do not defile yourself in any of these ways because this is how the nations that I'm gonna drive out before you became defiled. Even the land was defiled, so I punished it, of the land and the people, for its sin, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. In Deuteronomy 20, 17 and 18, it says, God says, completely destroy them, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, as the Lord your God commanded you, otherwise they will teach you against the Lord your God. In other words, they'll lead you into sin. Don't judge God on that. You know, there's a couple, couple of places that repented God didn't destroy because God always wants mercy first. He's always working mercy. In fact, in his judgment, we're seeing little pushes and waves and people still aren't waking up in our nation. It's uh, climate change. Wake up, America. God is, and his mercy, wanting us to get on our knees and turn from our sin. And Rahab's family is spared. As you look in chapter 15, let's jump down to verse 22. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, go into the harlot's house and bring the woman all she has out of there, as you have sworn to her. So the young men who were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brothers, all she had. They also brought out all their relatives and placed them outside the camp of Israel. They burned the city with fire and all that was in it. Only the silver and gold and articles of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord, but they didn't take it for themselves because they obeyed God. However, Rahab the harlot and her father's household and all she had, Joshua spared. And she has lived in the midst of Israel to this day, for she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Her faithfulness is a great message from Pastor Luke this morning. See, God always desires mercy, and that's what God gave to Rahab. And he's always going to give you mercy if you'll listen and pay attention, call on the name of the Lord. Now, I want you to, before I end here, I'm about done, I want you to see a curse on Jericho. Look at verse 26. Verse 26, then Joshua made them take an oath at the time saying, cursed before the Lord is the man who rises up and builds this city Jericho. With the loss of his firstborn shall he lay its foundation. And with the loss of his youngest son, he shall set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua and his fame was in all the land. Did that happen? If you're taking notes, take a pencil, take a pen and write this verse down. You ready? 1 Kings 16, 34. 1 Kings, look it up, 16, verse 34. Here's what it says. I'm going to read it slowly. This is the fulfillment of Joshua's word. In King Ahab's days, Hiel, H-I-E-L, Hiel of Bethel built Jericho. Uh-oh. He laid his foundation at the cost of Abiram, his firstborn, and set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. 1 Kings 16, 34. I'm gonna tell you what, the Bible is true. And when it says God hates sin and sin will be judged, listen to me and that you reap what you sow, we better run to his mercy. Because did Rahab reap what she sowed? Was Rahab judged? No, because she sought mercy, because God wants mercy. So if we don't want the judgment of God, we run to the merciful God. He was always there, like the prodigal father's son, running to us quickly. Now, 
Remember, the battle is the Lord's. Ahab, listen, Ahab reigned. I'm going to tell you about this. When this happened, when King Ahab's reign during Hiel, who built Jericho and his oldest and youngest sons died, as was prophesied, he reigned about 874 to 853 BC. That was hundreds of years, hundreds of years after the fall of Jericho. Hundreds of years afterwards, that prophecy came real. That'll tell us something, won't it? Remember, the battle is the Lord's. Some trust in chariots, but I will remember the name of the Lord. Amen? Some trust in horses, but I will remember the name of the Lord. It's not our armies. It's God. It's the Lord of hosts and his mighty uh, uh, angels, warriors. The keys to the battle of Jericho are then faith and obedience. We saw Rahab's bold faith and obedience. We see Joshua's bold and willing faith to follow the Lord in the battle, even though it seemed a bit weird in the tactic. Definitely not typical. Tumbling walls is what we think of with children. The walls came a tumbling down. But what we really see in this story is a bold, obedient faith born in the heart of an earnest seeker, a believer who fully trusted in the Lord of hosts because he heard and he obeyed. Faith cometh by hearing. And God may not show up like he did with Joshua and in the burning bush with Moses, but his spirit is here and it's the same. He will speak to you if you'll only dare to tune your ears. Three takeaways, here they are. Get your cameras ready. Cameras ready. The question isn't, is God on our side? Rather, he calls us to be on his side. Then he'll fight our battles for us. He is the Lord of hosts of all all the soldiers of heaven, all of the angels. Next one. Did you take a picture of it yet? Y'all get that? Anybody want to go back? Show me. Okay. All right. Here's the second one. Since God is leading our battles, we must be careful to listen to his directions and obey carefully as we show up for battle rather than trying to do it ourselves. That's the, Pastor Kerry, you and I talked about that a lot early on and since that when we do it in our own strength, we're gonna fail. It's gotta be God's strength. The last takeaway is this. Destruction of the Canaanites teaches us that sin is serious. God hates sin. We must take up our cross daily, crucify our flesh, and we must be a holy people, live holy. That's what we're gonna learn from this. And the other thing is, is when we, we can't do miracles, now I didn't put this up there, but we can't do miracles, but God's always willing to do a miracle. So on a personal note, let me tell you that every time I've seen a miracle, I wasn't trying for a miracle. I was amazed at the miracle. I was surprised by the miracle. I saw God do it, and it wasn't, I was trying to make a miracle happen because maybe I'd have got the credit. It just happened because I was looking to God and it's amazing when I see miracles happen. And they still happen today, folks. And if you need a miracle, let's believe God for it. Amen? He's able to do it. You tell God, you listen to God, you obey God, you follow God. And uh, you, you just, if you do that, that's what God wanted most. All right? You bow your head with me. How many, anybody here need a miracle from God? You just say, God, I want to hear you. And I want to act on that. I want to trust you, your way, not my way. You can see a miracle. How about for someone else? How about for someone else? There's loved ones need miracles, exactly. People that are wayward that need to come back to God. People that are very sick that need the Lord's touch, right? And those miracles happen. You know, the greatest miracle is people turning from sin. The greatest miracle is people getting right with Jesus. That's always the greatest miracle. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, just to the privacy of your neighbor. Anybody here say, I need Jesus to forgive a sin it bothers me, I feel guilt and shame, and I know God will take it away because that's God's business. And I'm not gonna insult him that any of my sin is too big for him to cleanse. He paid the price on the cross and his blood is powerful. Power to cleanse your sin. Remove all unrighteousness and sin from you. Anybody? All right. We're gonna, we're gonna do this. I'm gonna have Pastor Brett just play on the keyboard. Would you stand with me? And. I wanna ask you to either stand and pray, kneel and pray, find a place to pray. And when you're dismissed from praying, would you ask God what God wants to do? Hear God. See, I believe God wants to do miracles all the time. And hearing brings faith. Hearing comes by 
Faith comes by hearing and hearing from God, hearing his word, hearing he's speaking. He speaks what's in his word to us. And if God speaks something, believe it, act on it, and do what he gives you to do because then miracles come to pass. So let's listen to God. Let's, prayer is listening and then talking. Put him first. Listen to what he has to say before you run your own mouth. All right? Are y'all good with that? God bless you. Thank you guys for coming. And those of you that are watching online, if you need a miracle, God's here today. If you need Jesus to forgive you, he will forgive every sin. Not remember it against you. He will not judge you. He does not hate you. He loves you. That's why he hates sin. Because sin hurts the people of God. Satan loves sin. He's the one who encourages it. God loves you. Don't forget it.